Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Lori Fogarty. I'm the director of the Oakland Museum of California. And I am very pleased to uh, make the introduction this morning for our keynote address. Love is a great power. Use it to transform your world. These are the words of today's speaker, Erica Huggins, and the words by which she has lived her whole life. Erica Huggins is a human, right act, human rights activist, poet, educator, Black Panther Party leader, a former political prisoner, and a good friend of museums. Erica's desire to serve humanity began in 1963 when she attended the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. It was there that she committed to moving to the front lines of the global human rights movement. In 1968, at age 18, she became a leader in the Los Angeles chapter of the Black Panther Party with her husband, John Huggins, and she'll tell you a little bit more about that. In May of that same year, Erica and fellow party leader Bobby Seale were targeted and arrested on conspiracy charges, sparking the Free Bobby, Free Erica rallies across the country. While awaiting trial for two years before charges were dropped, including time in solitary confinement, Huggins taught herself to meditate as a means to survive incarceration. From this time on, she would incorporate spiritual practice into daily life, her community work, and her teaching as a tool for change, not only for herself, but for all people. From 1973 to 1981, Erica was director of the Oakland Community School, a groundbreaking community-run child development center and elementary school founded by the Black Panther Party. She created the vision for the innovative curriculum for the school, which became a model for and predecessor to the charter school movement. In 1976, Erica Huggins became both the first woman and the first black person to be appointed to the Alameda County Board of Education in the Bay Area. Since 1979, Erica has been working in California prisons and jails and also youth correctional facilities, teaching yoga, meditation, and mindfulness. In 1990, at the height of public awareness of HIV AIDS, Erica joined the world-renowned Shanti Project and developed a unique volunteer support program for women and children with HIV in the Tenderloin and Mission Districts of San Francisco, and helped develop citywide programs for the support of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth with HIV AIDS. Erica was a professor of women and gender studies at San Francisco State University and California State University East Bay, and most recently, a professor of sociology and African American studies in the Peralta Community College District. Erica was also a collaborator, partner, spiritual guide, and muse for our museum's exhibition, All Power to the People, Black Panthers at 50, last year. After Erica's remarks, we are going to engage in dialogue with the audience, and I just want to give you the heads up that we will have these very cool little Nerf squares that we will be tossing to the audience. They are microphones, so you can speak right into this and, um, and play a little catch and have a little dialogue with us. It's now my pleasure, museum friends, to introduce and please join me in welcoming Erica Huggins. Silence is beautiful, isn't it? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And thank you for being here. I want to thank Dean Phelous. I want to thank Veronica Mooney, the queen of conference planning. I want to thank the Oakland Museum, Lori Fogarty, uh, Kelly McKinley, Renee de Guzman, for inviting me first to be here 
for the panel yesterday. And I want to thank all of you from all over the United States for doing what you do tirelessly and continually to make educational work happen through museums. Educate, engage, elevate. Throughout some of our lives, museums have been a place to reflect on the past, to be in the present, and look toward the future. The word museum literally means a building in which objects of historical, artistic, or cultural interest are stored and shown to the public. educate. A huge topic in the last two days at this conference is making museums accessible and welcoming for everyone. This means that they must be diverse, inclusive in exhibit planning, content, and staffing. We know that diverse leadership can foster a shift in decision making. Isn't that true? Oh, come on, y'all. <laughs> yes, because the more ideas at the table, the better the something you're creating. This can be the legacy of your museum in Hometown USA. You can assure access at every level of museum life. So let me tell you my story. As a girl growing up in Washington, D.C., I participated in one field trip after another. The school bus drove from southeast D.C. to northwest because there were no museums in or near our neighborhoods. And we would go to the ballet, the theater, the galleries, and the museums. And teacher told us the trips would keep us from being culturally deprived. Her tone dismissed the possibility of little black girls and boys already holding and expressing culture. The nation's capital was filled with museums, but I didn't connect with the often sterile exhibitions. I dreaded the fourth and fifth grade field trips that required me to be quiet. Single file, please. Don't touch anything. There was no permission to engage the docents, no space for alternate points of view. I was bored. I was painfully aware as a teenager that the books used in public schools lacked the full United States history. Do you know what I mean? The Holocaust of North American indigenous people and the robbery of African men, women, and children from their homes and their subsequent enslavement in a land far away. In answer to my daily questions, my teachers, and my mother told me that books and museums were depositories of knowledge and history. Go there. And so I visited and I read and I walked away with more questions. Who decides what historical areas are researched and presented? Which high points in global and local timelines are marginalized or removed? Through whose lens is the visual, auditory, and written commentary on an era and the people who lived it made public? Who's uplifted or dismissed? Who speaks for me? Who tells my story? I was invisible. And I said I'd lived in Southeast DC 
where there was no ready educational, social, or political resource to prepare me and my friends to navigate a hostile world. History books didn't tell us about the culture of the continent of Africa. And my mother and father were not given that history either, so they could not tell it to me. When schools reminded me that I was culturally deprived, I asked, which culture? My heart told me something different than what teachers were saying. The beauty of the quilt sewn by elder women from scraps made into African patterns in the country, as my mother called it, in North Carolina. My grandmother's homestead, the lush green North Carolina fields, where cotton and its history have thrived for decades. The pungent smell of the silent, warm tobacco barn on my grandfather's farm. Osi, the son of a freed slave, made this farm with his hands for his wife and 11 children. The kind and easy ways of the South I knew, the hymns, the songs, the food, the laughter, the poetry of life of my five aunts and my five uncles, I was never desired, denied access to this, this living African culture. And as Lori said when she introduced me, at age 15, I went to the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedoms. And what happened there was, though all of the women were invited to speak, Lena Horne stood to the front of the stage, the songbird, the actor, the activist, and she sung two words, freedom. And when those words landed on our ears and entered our hearts, a silence fell over the thousands of people that day. And out of that silence arose these words from somewhere deep in me, I will serve people for the rest of my life. I wanted to be a part of that which moved which moved my family, my communities, my world forward. I recognized that my family tree was a living, resilient, human example of life lived after centuries of living in a racially violent social environment. And yet after high school, to please my mother by becoming one of the first of my family to go to college, I went to a historically black university to become a teacher. There I learned that social systems across the United States of America until at least 55 or 60 years ago didn't allow men and women like my mother and father, my grandparents, to vote, even though women were granted the right to vote in 1921. Women of color were forced to wait until the Voting Rights Act in 1963. There were these laws that didn't allow me to drink water from the same source as white people, to breathe the same air in a restaurant or in a school. And so I tried to make sense of this nonsense. Engage. I was one of the first 15 women to enter that historically black university. And that university was one of the three open during slavery. And I'll never forget the night when I looked across the road from the campus and there was a blazing wooden cross, and I stood and I said to myself, I must be brave. 
While there at Lincoln, Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton were writing the now famous book, a tiny little book called Black Power. And each Tuesday, Antoine, they would call a few of us together and we'd sit on the floor and they'd read to us from the unpublished manuscript. What was the power they spoke about? It was really simple. It wasn't scary to anybody. It was to understand history. First have knowledge of it, understand it, and then to reclaim the right to determine our own destinies. Power. It was 1967, and one day in the student center, I was given a magazine, and I read about Huey P. Newton and the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And shortly thereafter, I left Lincoln with John Huggins, my friend and husband-to-be, to travel the United States, to California, and join the Black Panther Party an organization that worked on behalf of all black and all poor people. Did you know that? All poor people. And we formed coalitions, by the way, with every organization that existed during that great time of the movement, which is how we got the nickname Vanguard. I was 18 when we got in that little car and started driving from Pennsylvania to California. John was 21. We were married and soon we were pregnant. And then, three weeks after our baby daughter was born on January 17, 1969, in the middle of the day, John and my dear friend, Al Princess Bunchy Carter, members of the Los Angeles chapter of the Black Panther Party and students at UCLA were killed. They were assassinated, actually, in Campbell Hall on that campus. A month later, I was asked by the community to start the New Haven, Connecticut, chapter of the Black Panther Party after I had arrived in Connecticut, John's hometown, to bury him. And a few weeks later, my baby was three months old. I was arrested with Bobby Seale, co-founder and chairman of the Black Panther Party. We stood trial for our lives. And as it was said earlier, the phenomenal response to the trial sparked free Bobby, free Erica rallies, not just in the United States, but all around the world. And I am forever grateful to all of the people, the students, the professors, the folks that came out to stand for justice. And I wish the same for those incarcerated today whether they're a member of a movement or whether they ended up in prison for other reasons, I think that we need to work toward healing practices rather than punitive ones. Both John and Bunchy's murders and the trial that Bobby and I were forced to enter were orchestrated by the clandestine subset of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Counterintelligence Program, or COINTELPRO. So they're in prison to save my life and my sanity, and to be able to be present with my baby daughter when she came to visit for one hour, once a week. I taught myself to meditate. 
And in isolation, I began to find out just what a treasure is inside every human heart. And I wondered, why wasn't I told this when I was a child? Why aren't we educating the children to know that there is great power within us? And through this spiritual practice that I have continued every day until this day, including this morning, I meditate and I recognize the openness in humanity. Even as the darkness struggles to gain power once again, there is humanity. After two years, obviously, the charges against me and Bobby were dropped. And I went back to California with my daughter, who was two and a half by that time, to serve as a writer for the Black Panther Party newspaper, which was read, and still is read, old tattered copies of it, by thousands of people around the world. The news wouldn't tell us the truth. So we wrote the best that we could, the real stories. And I worked daily in many of the party's 65 community survival programs. And in 1973, I became the director of the Oakland Community School, a community-based, tuition-free, child-centered, parent-friendly elementary school in the heart of East Oakland. And I can't assume you know East Oakland, but think of any black and brown community wherever you live. That is East Oakland. Our motto at this school, the world is a child's classroom. And we built the school not because we were knowledgeable educators at the time, but because we continually reflected on what would we have needed to be fully educated, for our whole beings to be educated. So when the children asked us for insight into the histories of black, indigenous, Latin, American, Asian American peoples and their cultures, because they weren't found, the answers to these questions were not found in history books. We found the answers for them. And I just want to say this was the late 1970s. There was no internet. There was no Google. There was no social media. And the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco had not yet been born. The Smithsonian National Museum of Af African American History and Culture was not there yet. And the Oakland Museum of California had not yet been revitalized. So when there was no exhibition or exhibit worthy of a field trip, the Oakland Community School staff brought the histories of people to the children and to the larger community. And the children spoke to beloved friends like Rosa Parks, Cesar Chavez, Sun Ra, Maya Angelou. And the favorite visit for me was the visit of James Baldwin. They were living history, and I was inspired. Museums can also be, and all, many of them already are, inspired revolutionary educational spaces. And thank you to those of you who are making that happen, who are pushing the veritable envelope for creativity. Museums can tell stories like mine. Museums can tell the story of my husband, John Huggins. Museums can tell your children 
about the life of my friend Bunchy Carter, who turned his peers away from gang war to the movement for freedom. Museums can offer breakthrough solutions for restoring justice on our planet, restoring our world, and changing our most pressing social challenges. That is, if our contiguous histories and cultures are made visible. When young, raise your hand if you're young. That means you're under 40. Just raise your hand. Yay. OK. Yay. Did you see it? Do you feel it? It's an honor to acknowledge you for raising the ones who raised their hands. When young and women of color and men of color and immigrant people and queer people and those with the lived experience of poverty, like our friend Kevin Jennings told us yesterday, are given curatorial and directorial access to the rooms, the halls, the screens, and the precious glass boxes of museums, then the decisions about which histories, which bodies are revered, which hallowed names become our heroes and sheroes, this positions us all for a brighter future. However, this means that the area in which one lives, her place, her position or state of affairs must be the focus of collective research made part of public discussion and shared with all, especially the children. There are small and large museums and galleries sprouting in cities or already existing in cities and states all over the United States and in other parts of the world. And I have had the great honor and privilege to visit a number of them. Not all of them. I've got to get a big tour bus and like just travel to museums. So many beautiful things are happening. How many young people that raise their hands are working in a museum now? Thank you. The first I want to mention to you is the Afro-Brazilian Museum in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where the parallels between the enslaved Africans who were sold there after the ships landed and the enslaved Africans who were sold here after the ships landed is made clear and visible. The ships went everywhere. And then there's MOAD, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. OK, you can cheer. <laughs> it is a great place. Please visit. Where I was in conversation with a young man named Ronald Porter, at the time a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley in Africana Studies. And our conversation was about the presence of LGBTQ people in the civil rights and in the black liberation movements. That was the best conversation. And if someone's mind thinks, oh, how'd they do that? It, it was just done. It just happened. It's diasporic. The Oakland Museum of California, where the community collaborated with members of the Black Panther Party, young artivists, scholars, and again, just folks, to create 
all power to the people, the Black Panther Party at 50. The museum director, Lori, the curators, the staff were so committed to having an exhibit that represented not the museum, but the people who lived during that harrowing time in history. And then there is the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Don't even let me know if you haven't been there yet. Just <laughs> don't, don't, please, don't let me know. You must go and go again and again and again and again and again, and you must spend time and learn and bring the learning back if you haven't. But many of you have been there. I know because I have asked. It is, it is heart-opening, heart-wrenching, touching, lovely. It makes you smile. It makes you cry. It is so different from the little closet-like thing that used to be in DC calling itself African American Museum. And I, I am sending all kinds of wishes for funding and moving the boulders out of the way for the Latin American Museum Center and the Asian American Museum Center. There must be money. There must be resources that will make that happen. And what I like about the Smithsonian, I mean, there's so many things I'd like, but the most astounding thing is that everywhere I went on all those floors in that beautiful museum is that there were young people of color in curat curatorial roles, in making things happen, in planning the exhibits, and in greeting people that they'd never met as they came in. I was smiling so much my face hurt because this was different. What I saw was different from the little girl who was bored and made invisible all those decades ago in DC. In these places, the four I named, I felt seen. So when your child goes on a field trip to one of the large, well-funded local museums to learn the history, for instance, of the indigenous people who were the real founders of what we call the United States, envision the curators, the staff, the docents as tribal peoples elevate. When you look around at staff, your members, your community outreach, who is there and who is missing? When you look at your decision-making processes, who is there and who is missing? We are on a precipice of new understanding. Young people in our institutions are reminding us that knowledge wanes without action. Action without knowledge is shallow. What action can we take together using our knowledge of the conditions of all the people that live in our communities? What can we do? We all aspire to be more connected? What is the work that needs to be done to achieve that goal? Our institutions can model it. Now I work with internationally, and of course locally, helping schools, universities, agencies, and institutions to make a world in which all people with all of their coinciding identities, histories, and experiences seen. 
I facilitate discussions and have seen firsthand the power to transform fear into openness and resistance into willingness. I want to thank all of you for being a part of that, for being brave in these times. There is an African tribal greeting that I love. And it's simply like this, and I'd like you to join me in it. The greeting is, I see you, and the response is, I am seen. I see you. I see, I see you. I see. I see you. I see. Doesn't that? I am seen. I am seen. Doesn't it feel great? Rather than, hey, what's up? <laughs> or, good morning. And then you say, well, it's not really a good morning. The, too much information, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think we have time to in, engage, to have dialogue. I don't have the answers to questions, but collectively we do. Um, so we're going to engage, and the fun catch boxes are appearing. <laughs> and we'll start with whoever has the catch box. It's a microphone inside there. Um, Is it on? So we'll be catching wisdom as it goes around the room. So I'm going to move away from the mic, and we will engage. So do, do you have something to say? I do. My name is Tracy Jones. I represent, Hi, Tracy. Hi. Um, I represent the <laughs> Birmingham Civil Rights Institute in Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> Um, home of Angela Davis, Sonia Sanchez. Thank you. I'm sorry. Well, somebody give her a hug. <laughs> oh. um, thank you for representing all women and fighting so hard for us to be seen in places where People don't understand oppression, and they, they, they can't see privilege. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity to work in a space to empower other people, to fight for people who can't or who hasn't found their voice. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I, I, I'm over here on the other side. Are you standing? I'll stand. Way in the back. Hi. Um, I am struck by um, your invitation about young people. Can you, can you say your name? I'm Eric Siegel. I work at the UC Botanical Garden. I still don't see you. I'm looking for you. <laughs> Hard to miss if you're waving. <laughs> I see you. I am seeing. <laughs> And you were asking? So I, I, I was struck by your sort of invocation of the young people in the, in the audience, and, and you're welcome to them. And I think I'd like to sort of remind us that people who aren't young, like you and me, um, have a huge amount to contribute. One of the powerful things about the Black Panther exhibition was that it did reflect the voice, not only of the young people's experience, but of how that experience has transformed people through their lives. So I hope that you'll continue to be a voice of people who lived powerful experiences when you were young, reflected on them over, over X years, and now share them with other people. And I think museums have that possibility too. So Thank you. I'd like to encourage us older people not to see the, um, the efforts to younger people and uh, to add our experience to that voice. And I would take it one step further Eric, right? Yes, that's right. And that is that we become mentors for younger people yeah. so that they are not scrambling to figure out history. That means we have to do our work to be honest and true 
to that history and not be afraid to break through. Young people are depending on us and I acknowledge them because so often in rooms like this, we do not acknowledge young people. And it's so important that the people, because we're not going to live forever, sorry, <laughs> that the young people will be here. And what legacy are we leaving? So certainly, you and I would not even be here today if it weren't for what we were doing when we were younger. We have a responsibility. Is there another question or comment? Um, does somebody have a catch box? There's a hand right here. Oh, there are two. Okay, and then when you're done, there's a person up. Can you raise your hand again so he can see you? He's behind you, in front of you. See her hand? If you throw it to her, that'd be great. All right, uh, hello everyone. My name is Russell Garnett from the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. I'm a native Washingtonian from Southeast D.C. as well. Um, one of the things that, I, that did st stand out for me was, again, the thought and um, acknowledgement of young people. I guess I am one of those young people who... Um, Can you hold the mic? <coughs> yes. there's, a, there's a reverb. It's not gotcha. you, but... I am one of those young people who when I used to go into museums as a younger person, didn't see myself. Not only in the, in the exhibits, but also in the staffs. But one of the things that brought me to the museum in which I, I work now was because I walked into those doors and the person greeting me and that took me on my tour looked like me. And that was an important thing for me. Living in Washington, D.C., you know, at that time it was Chocolate City. You know, That's right. And I'm going into a museum, and I didn't see people that looked like me. So when I did, it meant a lot. And I was able to kind of pay that forward to the young people that I work with. And they're able to see someone that looks like themselves as well. So thank you. And just thank you. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. OK. So good morning. My good name is morning. Dr. Bert Davis. I'm one of the board members of AAM, and uh, I think I speak for all board members and all members and staff and everyone here. A resounding thank you for being here. Um, two things. Could you expound on the role of women at the Black, in the Black Panthers? And also, you talked about um, LBGTQ and the role of Bayard Rustin in the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. So women didn't have a role in the Black Panther Party. Women ran the Black Panther Party. <laughs> OK. My friend Tarika Lewis, who was the first woman to join the Black Panther Party, said that when she walked in the office at age 16, she said the brothers just laughed. I said, what y'all laughing at? I'm here to serve the people. And Bobby Seale said, that's right. Be quiet, y'all. And she joined. And she's an artist, a violinist. And she's still an artist and a violinist. But she parked that in order to do all of the things that she did, including the, many of the back covers of the party newspaper. So because we live in a very sexist and homophobic society, it's systemic homophobia, it's systemic racism, and it is systemic sexism, it's important to look at what we were taught about who makes decisions. And but the point I want to make is that the FBI and local law enforcement arrested all the men first, thinking that we were just going to fold. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> and um, because we, held, we were the glue. 
And if Bobby Seale were here today, he would tell you this, that it was the women who took the vision and grounded it and made it happen in those 65 community survival programs. And it took a while for men to understand that women might be telling them how to do something. But that was because of the terrible social education we'd all been given. And we're still working with that today, by the way, let me just remind you. And, um, but that's what I mean by us all doing our inner work. And so um, women in the Black Panther Party didn't come to find a man. Nor did women in the Civil Rights Movement. I want to tell you about a really great book. It's called A More Beautiful and Terrible History. And it's, that title is taken from a quote by James Baldwin. And it's about the women, including Coretta Scott King, in the Civil Rights Movement. It is a beautiful book. And Tracy, read that book and have it available, at, if you can, at the museum where you work. It is phenomenal because it takes Coretta out of the, and others out of the shadow. It takes Rosa off that dang bus <laughs> and puts her into the real life she lived. And it also talks about the history of this. Uh, it's written by Jean Theo Harris, a dear friend of mine. So your other question about Bay and Re Bayard Rushton and Elaine Locke and all of them is that this systemic homophobia caused them to hide, uh, to protect the movement. How many of you heard Kevin Jennings yesterday? That was so, I was in tears. It was so beautiful. And he talked about that hiding that his Uncle Mickey had to do, that he had to do. And we should never have to hide who we are. All the bits of us should come in the door when we walk through but we've been trained to believe otherwise. So I believe you can find Ronald Porter's dissertation. Um, the name of it isn't fully in my mind. I don't want to booger it up. Um, you know, he, he did get his degree at UC Berkeley in Africana Studies, and he currently teaches in Florida. Um, and he wants to do that kind of conversation again. He is the, um, he's so eloquent about that history, which relates directly to his own life and to mine. So thank you for those questions. I really appreciate it. How many more minutes do we have? Or what is our time frame? Yeah, I yeah, see okay. you. I was just asking how much more time we have. Somebody will tell me. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Thank you. Okay, Ms. Huggins? Yes, she was next, and then the woman right there. Yes. Thank you for your patience. Yes. Hi, my name is Kalisha Davis. I'm Hi. A, I'm Director of Community Outreach and Engagement at the Detroit Historical Society. At Detroit? Historical Society. And we are still in the midst of the Detroit 67 project. It's our endeavor to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the uprising of 1967. It's something we're very proud of and pleased to have received the National Medal just this month uh, for our work. That is so, did everybody Thank hear you. her? Thank you. So it's, it's people like you in our community that really elevated the history and made it real and relevant for people of all ages. Um, but it took a bit and we, and we know now you know, what it takes to bring a story like that to the forefront and use it as a catalyst for conversation and change. And I'm curious, I'm wondering, especially based on your experience working for the Oakland Museum or with them as an advisor, like what would you recommend to other museums and institutions that, that want to peel back the layers but have some level of hesitation based on the support they have or their boards or 
um, what they would perceive as the, res the public response, like how to get that past some of those barriers and get to something that's actually real. Can the Oakland Museum people raise your hands because I'd like you to meet her? Would you raise your hands? Check with yes. them later. Yes, They're I was amazing. just there last year, and yeah, I, I totally follow you, follow you all too on Twitter, so well, you guys are what? awesome. <laughs> um, one of the things that I love that Oakland Museum did was listening circles with their staff, their board, and others. Listening is such a powerful tool for what is really being asked or said. Because we live in a culture in the United States where we have made an unsaid promise not to talk about race, we have. Then when we begin to talk about it in a place that isn't, we look for safe places. Let me say, look for a brave space. A space in which all the ideas can be stated without somebody pouncing on them. Listen for what other question might be underneath the question asked. And stay in the conversation. Um, Lori, I think it was, said yesterday that they were concerned that there might be a particular kind of pushback from various levels of the museum. But that didn't really happen. There were some questions that happened that that were brought up in these listening circles. But through dialogue, they were able to um, really look deeply at what is the fear, actually. Because racism, actually, is fear. Mm -hmm. Sexism is fear. Mm -hmm. Homophobia is fear. It's not really hatred, as Mahatma Gandhi said. So that is one thing. And talk again and again and again to people who have lived the experience and use that as part of your conversation with others. So thank you, and good luck in everything you're doing. Thank I can't you. wait to Appreciate visit. That. Yeah, we would love to have you. Please I'd come. I'd love to come be there. Us. Everybody in the room, come see us. Hi, Erica. Um, I'm really little, so if I stand, maybe you are not going to see me anyway. <laughs> My name is Paulina. I came from Santiago de Chile. I work at the Chilean Museum of Pre-Columbian Art. I invite you, all of you to go to see me. It's a really long way, but it's worth it. Um, we are here now because of you, because of women like you. We had Angela Davis just a few months ago at Chile. Yes. We didn't have rights. We didn't have a voice. Mm -mm. So please don't take things lightly, museum workers, men, men and women. We have a social responsibility. Yesterday I saw something that broke my heart. I saw a booth that had guns. It was from a museum, I don't remember which name, but it was just at the end of the stairs going to the museum expo. The, the display of the guns was like they were toys. And I saw some of you, museum workers, taking those guns and taking pictures, selfies. What are we doing? We are living such violent times. Women are getting killed, rape, we don't walk safely to our homes. Do you know, how do you feel every day? My friends has to ask me, did you, did you get home? Because we don't know if we're gonna get home. Latin American women, Afri African American women, Mapuche women, indigenous women, women from all around the world. And I see a booth with guns. That's dangerous. Don't take things lightly. Thank you. Thank you. When we are truly diverse, when our museums are equitable in staffing, then comments, observations, and even critique like yours can be heard if we are open. So if you, if you felt some kind of need to um, rebut what she said, listen more deeply. And
Jen, thank you. Thank you. I think we have one more, is that right? Two more or one more? I couldn't see your fingers. Three. Two. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rebecca Dupas, and I'm also from the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, and I'm looking for some advice. The conversations that I've been having or eavesdropping on, um, reading on Twitter, have been about uh, inclusion and erasure for people of color in the museum field. And a lot of times our passion in the fight is mistaken as aggression yes. or anger, yes. and it's very tiring. So as you were going through your amazing journey, and clearly you, you were steadfast in it, what were the encouraging words that you had within yourself or that you received to keep going and not simply find another space to try and do the good work? I said a few minutes ago that racism is actually not hatred, it's fear. And there is a, like in the psyche of America is the fear of retaliation for the enslavement of Africans. It's real. I'm not making it up. I didn't think of this yesterday. It's real, and it also has been researched. For those of you who want scientific evidence and proof. And we have not healed. South America, and I learned this when I was there, never had a civil rights movement. Nothing. Slavery, the end of slavery, boom. But here we have had all kinds of measures to move past the resistance and the fear. But there's still this psychic memory of slavery that traps us all. And we have to do our work, our inner work. And what you're talking about as tiring, I know that tiring because I facilitate conversations as I travel around the world. At universities, for instance, and this might make you laugh, where people call me and they say, Erica, can you come and lead us in a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion? We're all, we, we, we're all white. And one of the people who called me was a friend, so I was able to say to her, did you figure that out yesterday? <laughs> but then when I get there, what has helped me is to remember that I'm not alone. I don't know you yet, but there are people like you out there, and that gives me strength. There are people like you out there. There are professors on that campus, though they may be the only in rural Minnesota, the only person of color professor on the campus. This is true, this is what I see. But I'm heartened by the openness of that one person, of those two people. So look for allies, and I'm not using that word lightly, it gets tossed around. I'm talking about something as close to John Brown as you can get. Remember him? Someone who has your back, but won't co-sign your own off behavior. So yes, it's tiring. It wakes you up in the night, doesn't it? That you would be considered angry because you don't like being treated less than. So it's, so it's fear, it's based in fear, and you can be the opposite. You can be courageous, and you can ask questions. I have a friend from Gabon, and I always remember what her mother told me, told her about her fast mouth, okay? If you don't understand the term fast mouth, just ask somebody sitting next to you. Her mother told her, girl, you speak too quick. 
Roll that thing around on your tongue seven times before you speak. I love it because by the third time, you know you want to say it differently, right? <laughs> by the fifth time, you might know that that something needs to wait for another day. And by the seventh time, you're able to be, what's that word we love to use? Articulate. <laughs> I don't do that. Um, so uh, it will be clear. It will be direct. And we hope it will be compassionate. Because when people are, think about fear for yourself. When you are fearful, it's, your behavior is probably not rational, is it? Like, what's a fear that a lot of people have? Public speaking. What else? Heights. My mother had that one. She rode no escalators because she was positive she could fall through. It was real for her, so I didn't laugh or dismiss it. It was a real fear, but it's not rational. So think about your own fear as, you, as you're rolling that thing that you want to say around on your tongue. Think about you as a human being and what you would need if you were fearful. But don't spend too much time with a fearful person who is not ready to move. That is my suggestion. Is this the last one? Save the best for last. <laughs> I'm Ida B. Tomlin from Meridian, Mississippi. We just opened the brand new Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Experience in the small town of Meridian, my home, a home that I ran from in 1970 um, because I was ashamed of where I grew up. I wanted to be away from the oppression, uh, the discrimination, and wanted to explore the world. I went to Michigan, Massachusetts, and New York, and in Michigan where I started my museum career. I swore that I would never go back home again. And this community of museum professionals over the years have given me the courage to go back so that I could be uh, a voice for all of those who still feel oppressed and that I could be part of a museum that would recognize all the great artists from the state of Mississippi, which has so many negative uh, connotations and truisms. And I just want to thank you for everything that you have done in your career, in your life, to encourage a little four feet 11 people like me. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm sure you've read Alice Walker's book, Meridian. If you haven't, it's a wonderful book. And thank you, everybody, for your, for your comments, your statements, your questions, your concerns, your hesitance. Um, thank you also to the people who the catch boxes didn't catch. Um, and thank you for reflecting on the conversation we've just had. Um, thank you so much, and it has been an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll see you tonight at the closing party hosted by Children's Museum of Phoenix and the Arizona Science Center.